Welcome to all of you, especially to new members of our campus community, the freshman class, first semester graduate students, new members of our faculty and staff, and other visitors, and remote members of our community who will have a chance to view this lecture recorded very soon. I'm Walter Sterling, the Dean of St. John's College, Santa Fe, and it is my pleasure to continue the tradition of the Dean offering the first lecture of the annual Dean's Lecture and Concert Series the formal lecture, as it's called in the statement of the program, open to our whole community and the public and understood to be a component of our program of instruction. I remind you all that there will be a question period, there will be refreshments, uh, and five or 10 minutes after the lecture concludes, there will be a question period in the junior common room uh, to my right. We have an old saying at the college that the lecture is for the sake of the question period, and I offer the following advice to the freshmen. Whether you attend few or many of the formal lectures, you should on occasion attend the question periods. Perhaps to engage in the conversation yourself, but always in the hope of a live, uh, living and lively dialogue <clears throat> opening up among those who are most active in the question period. In particular, you might hope to hear tutors speaking, discussing, perhaps arguing with a directness that is typically rare in other settings. I also want to forecast an excellent lecture and concert series ahead this fall, composed by our lecture committee with more foresight and planning than we have been able to exercise the last two years. I commend to your attention the full calendar of offerings already published, and notably the two tutor panels occurring each of the next two Fridays at what will be our current standard time of 7 p.m. One on reading Homer, one on the place of laboratory within the liberal arts, and freshman laboratory in particular. These have been planned deliberately to continue to initiate you freshmen into our college community, but we would all benefit from attending them. The paper I'm about to read is a modestly revised and shortened version of a talk I gave in 2013. At that time, I was reflecting on the character of liberal education as this campus was preparing to celebrate its 50th anniversary, and as I found parts of our community debating questions of technological, cultural, and economic changes and their significance for our college. Today, nine years later, there is a somewhat different matrix of changes and debates in the air, but they continue to animate, I believe, our need to reflect on and account for the character and aims of liberal education. Such reflection for you students should probably not be a constant preoccupation. On the other hand, your view or understanding of why you are pursuing this education is always at least a tacit or inchoate guiding assumption. It is a view that will evolve while you are here in the pursuit of it, in the doing of it. And occasionally your decision to pursue a liberal education at this college may be subject to serious questioning and doubt, like Dante's doubts, finding yourself in a dark forest, the straight way lost. At those times it will be important for you to be resourceful in your own thinking and in drawing on the thinking of others around you to actively renew or deepen your sense of purpose. I hope that this talk scatters a few seeds for those cycles of life and reflection as Johnny's. In that spirit, uh, I offer uh, what I am putting under the title, Freedom of the Intellect is a Sacred Thing, borrowing that line from Tocqueville's Democracy in America a brief exploration of freedom, liberal education, and the St. John's College program. And I think the talk will go for about 45 minutes now. Yesterday in his convocation address, President Roosevelt distinguished St. John's from almost all other institutions of higher education uh, and from the trends that are dominating higher education, and he celebrated St. John's differences and excellence. As dean, I too spend a great deal of time following these trends and related debates and trying to offer thoughtful commentary on the place of the liberal arts, of liberal education, and of St. John's College in particular within this broader landscape. On the one hand, there is a sense in which nothing is new. There is nothing new under the sun, and we have heard all of these things before. Schools of thought, political positions, pressures, economic or otherwise, rise and fall or come in waves. The pendulum swings. 
I offer a quote that reflects some of the challenges to liberal education today, and I think this is the first quote on the handout. The student who proposes to attend a liberal college will do well to consider first the aims of liberal education. Two or three generations ago, there would have been no point in discussing those aims in a college catalog. They were implicit in the college curriculum. Today, college catalogs rarely discuss the aims of liberal education, but for a different reason. In the minds of our generation, they have become confused and obscure. Irrelevant aims have been substituted. Social contacts, athletics, college activities, vocational training, preparation for money making, merely satisfying minimum requirements for entrance into graduate and professional schools, the acquisition of pleasanter manners. Yet a liberal college is neither a club, nor a trade school, nor a finishing school, nor an asylum for the young unemployed. At least it ought never to consent to be these things. A liberal college should be concerned with supplying the student with a liberal education, and the student who considers entering a liberal college should know what the aims of liberal education are. Uh, many of you are familiar with this. Maybe the uh, language is a little uh, old-fashioned, and that's a clue. But while I presented this as a reasonable catalog of challenges to liberal education today, that's a quote from the 1937 St. John's College catalog. That passage written by Scott Buchanan uh, in the 1937 catalog, the first reflecting the new program introduced in Annapolis that year, I enter it as some evidence that there is nothing new under the sun. But not conclusive evidence. Beyond the perennial challenges, it does appear to me that there are longer and deeper changes. I often say that, apart from the short-term economic cycle and pressures which have roiled higher education in recent years, there are long-term economic, demographic, cultural, political, and technological changes that appear to grind, some slowly, some rapidly, but all inexorably, like tectonic plates changing the landscape of higher education in America and beyond. Of most relevance to St. John's College, the power of the idea or ideals of liberal education and of the liberal arts seem to have, over time, both atrophied and changed their meaning. The natural or traditional environment of liberal education, one of learning together face-to-face -to -face in small residential communities, is also under pressure. For those of us who believe that the very changes or forces that seem to imperil liberal education in fact make it more essential and more necessary, both for the good of individuals and for the good of society, we have the welcome opportunity to try to make our case, since to say the least, it does not appear that everyone takes for granted, if they ever did, the necessary or beneficial character of liberal education, either for the individual or for society. You students, you have chosen to pursue your education at St. John's. What is it that you have chosen? Over the years, I've read hundreds of admissions applications and other surveys of incoming freshmen. Based on such reading, among many other things, I, ha I do have some opinions about what may have led you here, but I will not try to summarize these opinions. One former dean, in a lecture on a related question composed almost 30 years ago, said the following, quote, all of you do in fact read books, and you came here to read more and to do it better. It is the one thing you have in common, this love of books, end quote. Now, I do not know if this was a just assessment then when it was written. I do hope there was and is some truth in it, However, I have some doubts as to whether it is as true now as it was then. An acquaintance of mine who met some of our students said that none of them talked about loving to read. Rather, they talked about other things as their reasons for being here, and he was rightly struck by that. Be that as it may, I invite all of you, freshmen in particular, to tell me anytime you wish, when you see me in passing, what you think you have chosen and why. What we, the college, say you have chosen is complex to be sure, but often we speak simply of a community of learning. In our most authoritative formulation, the statement of the program, we say, in fact, we begin by saying, St. John's College, the freshman just heard me say this at dinner, St. John's College is a community dedicated to liberal education. Now I'm gonna quote the opening two paragraphs from the statement, which are also on your, your handout. St. John's College is a community, and I believe Mr. Roosevelt quoted some of this yesterday. 
St. John's College is a community dedicated to liberal education. Liberally educated human beings, the college believes, acquire a lifelong commitment to the pursuit of fundamental knowledge and to the search for unifying ideas. They are intelligently and critically appreciative of their common heritage and conscious of their social and moral obligations. They are well equipped to master the specific skills of any calling and they possess, they possess the means and the will to become free and responsible citizens. St. John's College is persuaded that a genuine liberal education requires the study of great books, texts of words, symbols, notes, and pictures, because they express most originally and often most perfectly the ideas by which contemporary life is knowingly or unknowingly governed. These books are the most important teachers. They are both timeless and timely. They illuminate the persistent questions of human existence, and they bear directly on the problems we face today. Their authors can speak to us almost as freshly as when they spoke for the first time. For what they have to tell us is not of merely academic concern or, or remote from our true interests. They change our minds, move our hearts, and touch our spirits. This opening and the many pages that complete the statement has hardly changed over many decades, for better or worse. Many students were led here in part because of this statement. With this, I turn to my theme for the rest of this talk. The idea of liberal education is primarily invoked today in the context of higher or post-secondary education. In that context, it is contrasted to vocational or technical education, that is, education designed to prepare one to practice a particular trade, to pursue a particular career, or to gain expertise that can be applied in one's practical life. It is also contrasted to highly specialized education, to education designed to make one an expert in particular fields or areas of knowledge. In this context, it is also associated with a certain time of life, with the passage to adulthood, to becoming a mature human being. Liberal education is often associated with the liberal arts, and both phrases are defined by some relation to freedom or liberty, to the freedom etymologically embedded in the adjective liberal. We speak of liberal education as an education for or toward freedom, an education that is befitting free human beings or that produces free human beings. The seal of this college, for example, says, when translated from the Latin, I make free men from children by means of books and a balance. Sometimes we mean this freedom in a directly political sense, one that might be further tied directly to a particular and exceptional form of political life. In such a sense, liberal education might be understood as the education that prepares free citizens in a free society to exercise well their freedom or to be responsible citizens. In this sense, the idea of liberal education has been connected to the idea of liberal democracy, of democratic government that recognizes and protects, that nourishes and is nourished by individual liberty. The freedom that underlies the idea or ideal of liberal education is, however, a contested notion. It is often noted how this idea has changed or evolved over time through changing historical epochs. Beyond the important question of historical change, however, the advocates of liberal education do not agree about the nature of this enterprise. I believe that it is inevitable and desirable that there should be such disagreement. Such disagreement itself fosters and energizes the pursuit of liberal education. Okay, that was an introductory section. Uh, part two, four ideas of freedom. I will sketch in very general terms four paradigms that appear to me to exhaust at the same very general level, the competing notions of freedom. Freedom insofar as it informs living ideas of liberal education as an education for or toward freedom. I will label them in a couple of different ways, one of which will be to appropriate and perhaps misappropriate the names of four great thinkers. I will designate these alternatives Socratic, Hegelian, Thomist, that is Thomas Aquinas, and Nietzschean. First, the Socratic. What I'm calling a Socratic idea of the freedom that defines an idea or ideal of liberal, edu liberal education is one that has no master formulation in the Platonic dialogues that suggest this attribution, but is adumbrated throughout. One might begin with the image of the cave in Plato's Republic. 
all human communities, all political communities, are of necessity cave-like. They are held together by authoritative teachings that might take various forms, opinions or teachings about God or the gods, about the origin of human beings in general, and the origin of their own social order in particular, political or religious laws, cultural artifacts that shape the desires, the language, and the practices that hold the community together, and so on. That there are such nomoi, to use the Greek word for law or custom in an expansive sense, is necessary or natural for human beings. But it is also natural that we human beings, all of us on some occasions, and some of us insistently, desire to know about these things, and perhaps to know about all things for ourselves. That we question the truth or adequacy of our own nomoi, that we see that it is one way here and another way there, while human beings are perhaps the same by nature everywhere, and so on. Such questions may be spurred by idle curiosity, perhaps better put as a sheer desire to know, but they may also be motivated by our concern to do what is right, or to be good, or to be happy. These motivations always implicate the authoritative or pre-reflective education that has been passed on to us or imposed on us. The doubts and tensions that inevitably arise in our efforts to lead good or happy lives can, if thought through, call into question the coherence, the completeness, the adequacy or the truth of those nomoi. Some come to believe that it is incumbent on them as individuals to inquire into the foundations of their opinions about ultimate matters and to see if they can come to know for themselves the answers to such questions in place of answers that are often presupposed or attributed to authority. To discover better answers, to render more complete or coherent what is experienced as fragmented and, and uncertain. Such a view might presuppose something like the goodness of our own desire to know, that the highest things are or might be knowable, that progress and in inquiry into those highest things is possible and desirable, perhaps even if never completable. It might presuppose that there is a finite cosmos of fundamental questions or problems, and a finite array of principles or causes to all things. Be that as it may, at times at least, Socrates seems to embody or defend the idea that radical inquiry into the nature of all things, or at least into the whole of things that inform the questions of greatest importance to human beings, questions of the divine, of justice, of virtue, of happiness, and so on, that such inquiry is choice worthy for any human being who is capable of it, and that although rare and difficult, it is a precondition for the possibility of a good or free life. The unexamined life is not worth living. We are all like prisoners in, in a cave if we are not turned around and set on a path of liberal education or on a path of philosophic education that can liberate us. This general position would not necessarily generate any particular course of studies, any curriculum, but it might, and one could read the ensuing discussion in Book 7 of the Republic as one of the archetypal formulations of a curriculum of liberal arts and of the idea of liberal education. I will call this a Socratic or philosophic paradigm. Second, the Hegelian. What I'm calling a Hegelian, a Hegelian idea of freedom, of freedom as it pertains to the idea of liberal education, is one that is fundamentally social, cultural, and political. I mean this general idea to be more familiar to us and to capture almost all ideas of liberal education that understand it as somehow preparing a person to be a citizen of a free political community. And more broadly, to be a person empowered to live a free and fulfilling life in all the areas that go to make up our lives in a certain kind of social or political order. Unlike the Socratic, this idea does not presuppose either the possibility or desirability of an individual ascent from the cave it does not presuppose a radical questioning or skepticism regarding the social and political whole in which we find ourselves. Rather, to be free is to be able to take up the actual social, cultural, cultural and political world in which we find ourselves and to take our place in it in a fully realized, actualized, or engaged manner. To be free is to be adequate to the, to the demands and opportunities of life and of citizenship 
to have the range of skills, the cultural capital, and the self-consciousness that allow us to understand the world around us, the world that has in fact shaped us and with which we are indissolubly united. This is to make the actuality of the present world our own, to do so critically, to achieve an insightful perspective on the interconnections between superficially disparate phenomena, to diagnose and transcend hidden tensions that might otherwise riddle or pathologize our relation to the world. We should be able to appropriate and deploy the best of what is actual in the present, to think critically about and be adequate to the tasks of life in the modern age, to work, to be an active citizen, to appreciate art, to be capable of friendship and love, to be ethically responsible. This vision implies that there are a set of skills, habits of mind, and a reservoir of cultural capital to be acquired through our education. A fully realized relationship to the actual socio-political and cultural world is freedom. Hence, there is not or need not be an individual accomplishment beyond this of insight or knowledge or wisdom. And if there can be, it does not require the same opposition or skepticism towards the actually existing social, cultural, and political world as is suggested by the Socratic image of the cave and the Socratic paradigm more broadly. Stated with sufficient generality, such a vision seems to me to underline most public formulations of liberal education and more specifically, most modern and contemporary formulations, ranging from those associated with the American experiment and its founders to the formulations that have cultural currency today. I will call it Hegelian or progressive or simply modern. I offer two descriptions found on the website of the Association of American Colleges and Universities, passages that convey in a cogent and straightforward way this idea in a contemporary context and idiom, and this is on your hand, handout. From its founding in 1915, the Association of American Colleges and Universities has focused on advancing, advancing and strengthening liberal education for all college students, regardless of their intended careers. While the term is used in multiple ways, AACNU sees liberal education as a philosophy of education that empowers individuals with broad knowledge and transferable skills, and a strong sense of value, ethics, and civic engagement. Characterized by challenging encounters with important issues, and more a way of studying, more a way of studying than a specific course or field of study, a liberal education can be achieved at all types of colleges and universities. What is a 21st century liberal education? Liberal education is an approach to learning that empowers, this is not a continuous text, a different, different section, <clears throat> uh, is an approach to learning that empowers individuals and prepares them to deal with complexity, diversity, and change. It provides students with broad knowledge of the wider world, for example, science, culture, and society, as well as in-depth study in a specific area of interest. A liberal education helps students develop a sense of social responsibility, as well as strong and transferable intellectual and practical skills, such as communication, analytical and problem-solving skills, and a demonstrated ability to apply knowledge and skills in real world settings. The broad goals of liberal education have been enduring even as the courses and requirements that comprise a liberal education have changed over the years. Today, a liberal education usually includes a general education curriculum that provides broad learning in multiple disciplines and ways of knowing, along with more in-depth study in a major. In a certain sense, I conceive of these two paradigms as framing the basic alternatives for how education might be oriented toward freedom. The Socratic is ancient, but is kept alive, if nowhere else, in all genuine philosophical inquiry, and is echoed by something, something Oedipal perhaps, in the soul of each one of us that wants to get past everything derivative and authoritative and traditional and inherited to get to the bottom of things, to see for oneself, to be fully responsible for oneself, and so on. The Hegelian, on the other hand, echoes ancient formulations as well, but for our purposes, it is essentially modern and progressive, and is tied closely to the idea that the late history of our species is a history of progress in freedom and knowledge, and that the substance of our freedom is somehow actualized in a shared world of ideas 
and in a social order that does not oppose and schematize the various activities de demanded of all or almost all citizens into alternative ways of life or into opposing claims as to what constitutes the best in human life. Rather, this view, the Hegelian seeks to see, to integrate our lives as fully human and potentially free and freeing across the spectrum of our characteristic activities. There are two other variations or hybrids or less universal alternatives that I think need to be noted and added to these two, however. The first is religious and the second is personal or psychological. The third, the Thomist. A third possibility would be an idea of liberal education that is subordinate to religious or revealed or theological truth. Religious believers, at least in the Western monotheistic traditions, tend to believe that true or full freedom can only come to human beings through a particular relationship to God, through revelation or faith or grace or election or obedience to God's law. For those who believe this, the kind of education that could be common to the believer and the unbeliever has to be understood as partial or propedeutic or preparatory. If the believer thinks there is something like an education and freedom that is not necessarily consummated in a relationship to God, this merely natural perfection or assent is or should be ultimately in the service or under the authority of something higher, something not merely natural and not necessarily shared or shareable, even in principle, by all. Accordingly, education into true or perfect freedom must simply or ultimately merge with religious education. Or alternatively, education into that part of freedom that is common to our humanity, or at least common to the believer and unbeliever in a given time and place, is understood as a partial or subordinate good or education. I will call this a Thomist or theological paradigm. Finally, fourth, the Nietzschean. A fourth possibility seems tied to a peculiarly modern understanding of freedom that we are most free when we express or realize our own individuality, our own personality, when we are creative or self-expressive. For this to represent any kind of ideal or educational ideal, it cannot intend an inevitable or untutored kind of self-expression that we are all always engaged in. Rather, it sees educational activities, curricula, knowledge, and so on, not as serving a rational perfection of our nature, nor a social engagement, at least not in a normative, ethical, moral, political sense of realizing our place in society and fulfilling our responsibilities as citizens. Rather, all of that, the Socratic and the Hegelian together, so to speak, to the, to the degree to which it is cultivated, is itself instrumental to some higher end that is more personal, ineffable, psychological, or aesthetic. I will call this a Nietzschean or romantic paradigm. Although I find it useful to deploy these authors' names, these categories are extremely general, and I do not mean to reduce the thought of the individuals whose names I have appropriated to these loose and abstract sketches. Nonetheless, I struggle to see beyond these another meaningful or living alternative idea of freedom that can or does inform an educational ideal or animate and order a living educational community. I do think that many communities or institutions, including almost all colleges and universities in this country, are in part animated by one or more of these ideals. In fact, almost all such communities are animated by some combination, by more than one of these, even if the combination is finally subordinated to one or another, or to some other end, not tied directly to freedom. However, the pressures on such institutions, on such communities, to make hard choices, to account for themselves, to adapt to ever-shifting cultural and political realities, invites and perhaps compels them and us, each of us, to consider the alternatives and to take a stand somewhere, or to decide the matter for oneself, or to keep the question open as a living and urgent question. On the margins of all these alternatives, and integral to the contrast of the Socratic and the Hegelian ideas, is a question about the actual existence of institutions of liberal education. There's a kind of obvious paradox or tension, and I often comment on this, involved in institutionalizing the pursuit of individual freedom, or put 
you know, I'm stressing those were institutionalizing the pursuit of individual freedom, or put differently with having a tradition of liberal education. I will not delve into this crucial theme here, but it underlies and runs through the whole discussion. Perhaps it is enough to note that there is obviously some difficulty in seeing how the Socratic paradigm could come to have an institutionalized existence. On the other hand, the Hegelian paradigm seems almost to be the necessary pa paradigm, the necessary public face of any institutionalized form of liberal education. Each of the other two sit in their own complex relationship to that question. Part three, practicing Socratics. If there is anything to this schema I have provided, perhaps it is worth asking, what do we intend at St. John's College? I've thought about this question, not always in these terms, for over 30 years since I was myself uh, a freshman here. Uh, as a student, as an alumnus, as a tutor, and as dean. I've come to believe that the best answer that can be given is that we are practicing, but not principled, Socratics. What I mean by this is that our characteristic approach to inquiry, to learning, to education, is to encourage Socratic inquiry, to be as Socratic as possible, so to speak, while at the same time not assuming any answer to or pronouncing upon the fundamental questions, including the question of what constitutes the freedom toward, towards which we are aiming. This includes not assuming that the peak of education is what it appears to be in the Socratic treatment. At the same time, the college maintains an institutional and communal existence that is as harmonious as possible with the modern democratic social and political order, the American democratic social and political order, within which we find ourselves and to which all or most of us must return, so to speak, as citizens and as human beings living our lives here and now. I do consider this a reasonable description of the college's practice, past and present. I do not think it is by any means a consensus view or self-understanding of what we are or of what we ought to be. There is, happily, I say, no such consensus view. Furthermore, I note in passing that this view is not easily reconciled with the full opening of the statement of the program that I read before, the emphasis on citizenship. I say happily there, I say happily there is no consensus. It is characteristic of liberal education that it both fosters and is fostered by disagreement and discord among its advocates and practitioners regarding its nature and its aims. This is no less true, perhaps it is more true, within this college community than it is in many other communities. I assert we are practicing Socratics among other reasons because I do not believe that this program would be designed this way unless guided by a concern, a doubt, about modernity. A concern that the modern age is no less and maybe more of a cave than traditional or pre-modern societies. If one were confidently modern, Hegelian in the sense I sketched above, I do not think one would design this program. This does not mean the natural end of the program is a confident alternative to the modern view. It does mean that we are driven above all by the desire to think for ourselves about the most important things and about the whole of things, and that taking for granted the authoritative opinions regarding politics or regarding the state of scientific knowledge are obstacles to that freedom. Conversely, the particular books, the kind of reading, the kind of inquiries, the kind of arts, the kind of habits of mind, and the kind of conversations we try to cultivate here are, at least potentially, capable of effecting the kind of detachment, a somewhat violent detachment, if Socrates is right in the Republic, from our immersion in the brute fact of what is present, what is apparently actual here and now. In this spirit, I will introduce the quote from which I borrow the title of my lecture. It is a passage from Tocqueville's Democracy in America, in which he states in germ, in a seminal form, so to speak, the impetus for a Socratic education in the modern democratic social and political context. The passage is highly rhetorical and is one twist in the long complex dialectic of that masterpiece and, and of his diagnosis of our condition. Uh, I will not explicate it further. I will not do more with it than, than read it. 
I do want to acknowledge that I had the pleasure this summer of uh, leading a preceptorial uh, in the Graduate Institute in which we read most of Democracy in America, including this passage. So I thank uh, my fellow travelers from this summer for that opportunity. So I'm going to read this extended quote, which you should also have in your handout. <clears throat> and everyone should read this book more than they do. Uh, I know that among Americans, political laws are such that the majority reigns sovereign over society, which greatly increases the empire it naturally exercises over the intellect. For nothing is more familiar to man than to recognize superior wisdom in whoever oppresses him. This political omnipotence of the majority in the United States in effect augments the influence that the opinions of the public world otherwise obtain over the mind of each citizen. But it does not found it. It is in equality itself that one must seek the sources of that influence and not in the more or less popular institutions that equal men can give themselves. It is to be believed that the intellectual empire of the greatest number would be less absolute in a democratic people subject to a king than in the heart of a pure democracy, but it will always be very absolute. And whatever political laws regulate men in centuries of equality, one can foresee that faith in common opinion will become a sort of religion whose profit will be the majority. Thus, intellectual authority will be different, but it will not be less. And so far am I from believing that it will disappear that I augur that it might readily become too great, and that it could be that it might in the end confine the action of individual reason within narrower limits than befit the greatness and happiness of the human species. I see very clearly two tendencies in equality. One brings the mind of each man toward new thoughts, and the other would willingly induce it to give up thinking. And I perceive how, under the empire of certain laws, democracy would extinguish the intellectual freedom that the democratic social state favors, so that the human spirit, having broken all the shackles that classes or men formerly imposed on it, would be tightly chained to the general will of the greatest number. If democratic peoples substituted the absolute power of a majority in place of all the diverse powers that hindered or retarded beyond measure the ascent of individual reason, the evil would have done nothing but change its character. Men would, have found this, men would not have found the means of living independently. They would only have discovered a difficult thing, a new face for servitude. That, I cannot repeat too often, is something to cause profound reflection by those who see in the freedom of the intellect something holy. I borrow my title from a different translation and who hate not only the despot, but despotism. As for me, when I feel the hand of power weighing on my brow, it matters little to know who oppresses me, and I am not more disposed to put my head in the yoke because a million arms presented to me. More important than my assertion that we are practicing Socratics, who are therefore only uncomfortably institutionalized and conventionalized, would be an argument that we should be such. I'm not attempting that here. In fact, I'm not sure I believe it without reservation or without qualification. What I do argue, however, however, is that we should not abandon the demand to account for what we mean by liberal education, by being a community dedicated to liberal education. And therefore, we should not abandon the demand that we account or that each one of us account for the freedom to which we aspire. However dimly we, we might understand that goal, however imperfectly we might realize it, and however uncertain we might be. Beyond this, I consider it important to recognize that neither this college nor any other comparable non-religious educational community aspiring to liberal education and worthy of that name can confidently assert that it knows fully what constitutes our freedom, freedom in the most important sense, much less how to make men, women, and free, our college seal notwithstanding, I make. Um, why? Because we are all inheritors of all the fundamental alternatives that I outlined above. They are all some part of the air we breathe. Allegiance to one or another appears to divide us, to divide our communities. That is, we share our lives with partisans of the different positions, and perhaps more disconcertingly, the alternative views appear to divide us internally. Each of us feels called confusingly to more 
than one of these positions. Without being able to demonstrate this, I would have us believe that this uncertainty, tension, or conflict is all the more reason to pursue a liberal education, understanding thereby that liberal education involves risks and sacrifices beyond those of time and treasure. It requires courage and may involve hard choices or may make choices hard that did not seem so before. Uh, section four, a brief digression on books and a conclusion. Before concluding, I, I want to speak briefly to the question of why we read these books. In a slightly different context, I responded to a parent's related question, parent of incoming freshmen's related question, by saying this question is hard not because of a lack of reasons, but because there are so many reasons. There are so many benefits. I want to assert a few and let them radiate out again to the question of freedom and of the Socratic way. I would say that reading books, just books, but especially these books, so-called great books or classics, is beneficial as a serious and substantial counterweight to the deluge of scattered information or content received digitally and online in a variety of modes that goes to constitute, to our peril, ever more of the reading we do and dominates ever more of our attention and our time. There is, and I wrote this nine years ago and it's more true now, there's a growing literature on the way this technological momentum is changing how we think as we interact constantly with such thin, accelerated and fragmented words, images and sounds. Reading very fine works of literature in a broad sense is a respite, a break, but not only a respite. It is not a respite, say, in the way that lying on the beach is a respite. Perhaps this summer some of you tried to read the Iliad or Quixote or Genesis or War and Peace while lying on the beach, in which case you may have discovered, as I would, or been reminded how different in kind these two respites are. When we read, our minds are active and engaged. Our minds are more active and engaged when we try to read, appreciate, and understand very fine works than when we are agitated by a scattered deluge of information and images. We develop superior powers and habits of mind when we take in better works, and we refine our tastes and sentiments as we do so. As I have said of liberal education, I say of reading books, good books, and these, some of the very best books, precisely for the reasons that such reading is in decline, it is more necessary and more beneficial for us to undertake it. Beyond this, reading these books can be understood to be part of a liberal education conceived on any of the models I have presented, their influence, their intrinsic power, the value of seeing original and foundational arguments and evidence for things that later come to be taken for granted or become popularized or represented in derivative terms and so on. All of this frees and empowers the mind on any of the accounts offered above. Furthermore, the very best books are themselves instances of wholes and of wholeness in various ways. Insofar as liberal education aims at a kind of wholeness, both in what one studies or learns, and insofar as we are trying to be whole or complete human beings, the very best works of art, especially books, may be our finest exemplars. Many of us could go on and on with such reasons and such potential benefits. These things are true whenever and wherever such books are read thoughtfully and well. But I want to return to my claim above to argue that reading these books, the ever shifting but recognizably similar set of texts that have constituted our undergraduate and graduate programs is best understood on the Socratic model. Why? In the case of our undergraduate program, and we could say something similar about the graduate programs, that we would put such emphasis on great works from a tradition continuous with our contemporary world and works across the disciplines and weight the program the way we have, one year devoted to the Greeks, the first three years devo devoted almost exclusively to texts written before the 19th century, and almost no work on the seminar reading list currently that was written after the first half of the 20th century. 
All of this seems to me tied to our trying to provide students with the strongest possible levers to think beyond and outside of the world of the present and the ideas that dominate it. To get back to the roots and sources of those ideas, to be sure, but also to get back to forgotten or neglected ways of thinking that challenge the authoritative opinions of the present. Practicing Socratics need to try to think for themselves, and there is no better tool for trying to free oneself from the cave-like character of the present than the greatest and most challenging works of the past. One need not be a Luddite or reactionary to be Socratic in this sense. However, to echo what I said above, if we did not have doubts or concerns about the lasting or permanent value of what is immediately present to us, if we did not have concerns about the biases characteristic of our time and place, perhaps especially the bias toward inevitable or necessary or rational historical progress, if we did not have concerns that the cave of the present is the difficulty for us precisely because it is our cave, the cave in which we find ourselves, then it seems doubtful to me that we would design a program as we have done. I will concede that I believe many of my colleagues and many other members of our college community do not quite share this view, although I believe they find it a recognizable and plausible interpretation. To conclude, if on the one hand you are more confident that our world of the present, our authoritative opinions, our laws and so on, realize or embody the expressions of freedom, the means of freedom to which you aspire, then I suggest you tend toward what I have called a Hegelian understanding, and that paradigm of how education is an education to or for freedom will be that by which you navigate. It may be that there is no better way to pursue such a Hegelian or modern liberal education than what we do here at St. John's. I am not sure. If, on the other hand, like Tocqueville, you have doubts concerning those same authoritative opinions, if you think that our society might be no less or may even perhaps be more cave-like than, than some of those of other times and places, I am still more confident that there is no better place to pursue a Socratic education and a Socratic ideal of freedom of the mind than St. John's. You might then join Tocqueville in his fear that however great the benefits of modern life, and like Tocqueville, I for one consider the benefits of modern life extraordinary, our same modernity might bring new and distinctive bonds to intellectual freedom. Such a fear is all the more reason to join Tocqueville as one, quote, who sees freedom of the intellect as a sacred thing, end quote. However, beyond this, one should say that the question remains open. It seems to me that the Socratic position is the one alternative that makes assumptions about the end or goal of freedom and its possibility and the means to it, and yet does not claim to know that such freedom in the fullest sense is, as he describes it, or to know that such freedom is possible. In the end, the dispute over the nature of the freedom to which our education might lead us, like those that underlie all the most important human questions, what is God, what is justice, what is a human being, what is nature, is itself a spur, that is the dispute over the nature of freedom, is itself a spur to inquire a reason to begin the inquiries that may indeed lead to freedom of the mind, to an examined life, to knowledge of all things insofar as that is possible. The fact that we disagree and disagree about the highest ends of education and that we hold one another to account for our, dif our differing opinions with reason and with civility, this fact or situation may provide the most promising beginning for a truly freeing education. Thank you very much. Thank you.